Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be speaking about the gerund. The gerund is a non-finite form of the verb, very common in English, that competes in a manner with the infinitive, which we discussed in our previous lesson. You can watch that lesson following the link in the description to this video. To begin with, let's specify what the main characteristics of the gerund are. The gerund is a non-finite form of the verb that in a sentence functions as a noun. It is formed by adding the suffix ing to the stem of the verb. In its form, the gerund coincides with participle 1, also known as the present participle. The gerund has double nature, it possesses both nominal and verbal characteristics. Let's talk a little bit about the form of the gerund, the way it is formed, before we dive deeper into the topic. So, as you already know, the gerund is formed by adding the suffix ing to the stem of the verb. However, the end in ing can be seen in different contexts, not only in different verb forms, but also in verbal nouns and adjectives. Look at the word painting. By merely looking at this word, you cannot say if it is a gerund. Let's try to put this word into a context. The painting is finished. Jane likes painting. Painting is my hobby. I like painting. The first two examples contain verbal nouns. How can we say that? Well, by looking at what precedes it. In the first sentence, the article the precedes the word painting, so we see that this is a noun. The painting is finished. In the second case, it's a demonstrative pronoun. Jane likes this painting. Again, we are speaking about a noun. In the third and in the fourth examples, painting is a gerund. Painting is my hobby. Doing what is my hobby? Painting. I like doing what? I like painting. That's a verbal that has characteristics of a noun, a gerund. Let's look at two more examples with the same word formed with the help of the same suffix ing. Paint in this picture, I was thinking about my childhood. While I was painting, I heard the doorbell ring. In these two sentences, painting is participle 1. In the first sentence, it functions as an adverbial modifier of time. When was I thinking about my childhood? While I was painting this picture. And in the second sentence, it helps us to form the present progressive tense. Let's take a look at a different word. Building. It's a beautiful building. In this sentence, building is a noun. It is preceded by the article a. His occupation is building houses. In this sentence, it's a gerund. Building this house, we learned a lot. Here, it's a participle 1. And prices for building materials are growing. In this case, building is an adjective. It modifies the noun materials. So, looking at these examples, we can conclude that the suffix ing can be used to form not only the gerund, but also other things, other verb forms, verbal nouns, adjectives. So, we have to pay attention to where we find the ing form in the sentence. As I have already mentioned, Gerunds have double nature, so they have something of a noun and something of a verb. Let's first speak about nominal characteristics of the gerund, that is, what common features it has with nouns. The nominal properties of the gerund are The gerund can perform the function of subjects, objects, and predicatives. Examples Eating junk food ruins your health. Gerund here functions as the subject of the sentence. Some people like fishing. Here, gerund is the object. My brother's favorite occupation is sleeping. In this sentence, gerund functions as the predicative. It is a part of a compound nominal predicate. Is sleeping. Another nominal property of the gerund is that it can be preceded by a preposition, just like nouns, right? Thanks for letting us know. Alan insists on doing everything himself. 
I'm thinking of going to the cinema tonight. My friend is good at working with clay. Michael is proud of having studied at Oxford. Another nominal property of the gerund is that it can be modified by a noun in the possessive case or by a possessive pronoun like nouns. For instance, I don't like your going to the concert without me. Pay attention that it's not you, but your going to the concert without me. His living without saying goodbye was rude and disrespectful. Again, it's not he, not him, not the nominative case, not the objective case, it's his. We use the possessive pronoun. Anne hates her boyfriend's working so late. Here, the noun boyfriend is in the possessive case. Her boyfriend's working so late. Frank couldn't find an excuse for his parents leaving him. The same parents is in the possessive case. If we replace the gerunds here with some nouns, the pronouns and nouns that precede them will retain the same possessive form. Let's do that. I don't like your departure, for instance, and hates her boyfriend's work. Frank couldn't find excuse for his parents' betrayal. Please note, though, that in some informal contexts you will hear a noun in the nominative case used in front of a gerund. You will not find such sentences in formal writing and using the nominative case or the objective case in front of a gerund is not a habit that I want you to acquire. So let's remember that the gerund can be modified by a possessive pronoun or a noun in a possessive case and that's it. These were the nominal characteristics of the gerund. Now let's talk about its verbal characteristics or what things the gerund has in common with verbs. The verbal properties of the gerund are The gerund of transitive verbs can take a direct object. For instance, Francesco has made a good progress in speaking German. Anthony didn't like studying chemistry at school. I wish I could stop forgetting people's names. I'd rather you stopped using the word kinda in every sentence. Sam started singing her favorite song. Learning languages has a lot of advantages. In all of these sentences, gerunds take direct objects. By the way, why are we talking about transitive verbs only? Because intransitive verbs cannot take a direct object. For instance, an intransitive verb is to arrive. How can you add an object to this verb? You cannot say to arrive what, but you can say to speak what, to study what, to forget what, to use what, to sing what, to learn what, etc. Another verbal characteristic of the gerund is that it can be modified by an adverb like other verbs. Working out regularly will help you stay fit. I don't like speaking loudly when there is no need. She burst out crying bitterly. So regularly, loudly and bitterly are adverbs that modify our gerunds. And one more verbal property of the gerund. The gerund has tense distinctions. The gerund of transitive verbs has also voice distinctions. Let's see. I don't enjoy going to the dentist. Peter doesn't like being asked about his plans. Thank you for having lended me your car. They regretted having been deceived. In the first sentence, going is a simple active gerund. In the second sentence, it's a passive simple gerund. In the third sentence, we're dealing with a perfect gerund, active. And in the last one, it's a perfect gerund, passive. Let's take a closer look at the forms of the gerund. The gerund of transitive verbs has both tense distinctions and voice distinctions. We are talking about two aspects here, simple and perfect, and two voices, active and passive. So the simple gerund active is playing, the simple gerund passive is being played. 
the perfect gerund active is having played and the perfect gerund passive is having been played. The tense distinctions of the gerund are not absolute but relative. If you watched my lesson on the infinitive, you know what I'm talking about. When we speak about relative tense distinctions, we speak about how the non-finite form of the verb is related to the action of the main verb, whether it happened prior to it or was simultaneous with it. Let's take a closer look. The tense distinctions of the gerund are not absolute but relative. The simple or indefinite gerund denotes an action simultaneous with the action expressed by the main finite verb. Depending on the tense form of the main verb, it may refer to the present, past or future. Helen likes listening to classical music. This sentence speaks about the present. We can see that by the main finite verb likes. Our simple gerund here expresses the same tense. We are in the present. We show no priority. It shows us that the action of listening is simultaneous to that of the main verb. When he was young, Tim liked gathering mushrooms with his grandpa. This sentence is in the past. We see that by the main verb liked and the action of the gerund gathering is simultaneous to that of the main verb liked. So it's also in the past. And Jeremy won't rest without knowing that his family is safe. Here we speak about the future. Again, we can say that by the main verb, will not rest. The predicate is in the future. And the gerund is also speaking about something that is yet to come. So it expresses an action simultaneous with the action of the main verb. This is what the simple gerund does. Let's now look at the perfect gerund. The perfect gerund denotes an action prior to the action of the main finite verb. I am ashamed of having been so naive. I am ashamed is a state in the present and having been so naive is a state that preceded it. So it speaks about something that happened before. Let's go one step back in time. Mary denied having spoken to him. Mary denied is an action in the past and having spoken to him is an action that preceded it. So it goes even further back in time. And let's take one more step back in time. Jane had been crying out of anger at having been so easily deceived. We see that she had been deceived even earlier. Yeah, that she had been deceived before she had been crying. Jane had been crying is an action in the past that preceded another action. This is why we use the past perfect tense here. Yeah, so we can imagine a context. The sentence is from where we previously spoke in the past simple and to denote that this was an action that happened before the past simple we use the past perfect. The past perfect continues in our case. And this having been so easily deceived is an action that preceded the past perfect. So in all of these examples, we see actions that happened prior to the actions of the main verbs. This is why we need the perfect gerund to show that priority to show that we are dealing with something that happened before the action of the main verb. Let's compare these two sentences. Sue regretted not learning Spanish. And Sue regretted not having learned Spanish. What can we say looking at these two examples? What is the difference between them? Well, obviously the difference is that in the first case we use the simple gerund, whereas in the second one we use the perfect gerund. What information does it give to our interlocutor, to our listener or reader? Well, in the first case our interlocutor understands that she regretted that she didn't know Spanish, that these actions were simultaneous and in the past. In the second case, our interlocutor understands that she regretted that he hadn't learned Spanish 
before. And here we see that one action preceded the other. So in the second case, I'm speaking about Sue's regrets about his past, not about the state he was in, in the particular moment in the past when we were talking to each other. I hope that's clear. Let's move on. At times, a prior action may be expressed by a simple or indefinite gerund. This happens after the verbs to remember, to excuse, to forgive and to thank, as well as after the prepositions on, after and without. I don't remember seeing him before. I don't remember having been in this district before. Both sentences are grammatically correct and they express the same thing, that I don't have a memory of doing something. After searching for an hour, he finally found his drone in the tall grass. After having spoken to everybody, she withdrew to her room. Again, you can go both ways here. You can use the simple gerund or the perfect gerund, and they will express the same thing. Now, the gerund of transitive verbs has special forms for the active and the passive voice. He doesn't like telling people what to do, and neither does he like being told what he should or shouldn't do. So, telling is the active voice and being told is obviously the passive voice. Please note that after the verbs to want, to need, to deserve, to require and the adjective words, the active gerund is used, though it is passive in meaning. Let's see. The house desperately needed painting. His work deserves praising. No job is worth dying for it. There is nothing here worth discussing. Though we use the active gerund in all of these examples, the meaning that it expresses is passive. Now, just as other non-finite forms of the verb, the gerund can form predicative constructions. What am I talking about? Let's start with taking a look at some examples. His friends are used to his leaving without a goodbye. So what do we see in this sentence? We see that his friends is the subject. It is followed by the verb are, but that's not all. We also have some other elements that obviously belong to the verb to be. They are connected to it. So this whole thing, he is living without a goodbye, is a predicative construction. We see that the gerund living is in predicate relation to the possessive pronoun his. Remember that the pronoun that precedes is always in the possessive case. Let's look at some other examples of compound predicates and the gerund in them. I don't like their smoking in my apartment. They don't mind my sisters playing the violin late at night. Our family insisted on our leaving the country. Jane wasn't aware of her friends lying to her. So, these are all compound predicates. They contain predicatives of which the gerund is a part. Sometimes the nominal element of the predicative construction may be expressed by a noun in the common case or by a pronoun in the objective case. This is something that I want to stress because you might see such sentences somewhere or you might hear them from people around you. They are just not very good English because this is not something that you would use in formal writing. We celebrated our friends winning the contest and we celebrated our friend winning the contest. In the first case, the noun is in the possessive case. In the second case, it is in the common case. He objected to my going there alone and he objected to me going there alone. The pronoun in the first example is possessive. The pronoun in the second example is in the objective case. But again, I want to stress that this is not a very good language habit. Let's now talk about the functions of the gerund in a sentence. The gerund may be used in different syntactic functions. In most cases, it is a part of a gerundial phrase. First and foremost, the gerund is used 
as a subject. Let's see. Sleeping is vital for good health. Growing your own food is very rewarding. Fishing with nets is illegal in many regions. Eating vegetables improves your body's digestive system. In all of these examples, the gerund functions as the subject of the sentence. The gerund used as a subject not only can precede the predicate, but it can also follow it. In this case, the sentence starts with the introductory it or with there is. Here I have a lesson dedicated to untypical word orders in English where I explain the phenomenon of this introductory it or the dummy subject. So you can check that video if this is something that you don't know or you want to revise. Let's now look at the examples of the gerund used as a subject after the predicate. It is no use reading this article. There is no point in arguing. If a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing well. The last sentence is an English proverb. Why do we say that the gerund is the subject here? Let's paraphrase the first sentence. Reading this article is of no use or is useless. So the true subject of the sentence is reading this article. There is no point in arguing. Arguing is pointless. Please know that there is a different approach or a different view according to which uh, it is the subject of the sentence and the rest of it is a predicate. The gerund can be used as a part of a compound nominal predicate. In a compound nominal predicate, the gerund functions as a predicative. So what is a compound nominal predicate? It's a compound predicate that consists of a link verb, like to be, and a predicative, the nominal part, which can be expressed with different parts of speech. These are some simple examples of compound nominal predicates. Tim is my friend. The weather is cold. My hobby is fishing. You see that this nominal part can be represented by different elements. It's my friend in the first case, is cold in the second case, cold is an adjective, yeah? And my hobby is fishing is the gerund. So the gerund can be used as a part uh, of the compound nominal predicate. Let's look at more examples with the gerund in this role. My hobby is fishing. All they wanted was getting back home. The best thing is reading as much as you can. The next step was assembling the cold frame. Now, apart from that, the gerund can be a part of a compound verbal predicate. What kinds of compound verbal predicates do we have? We have the compound verbal modal predicate that consists of a modal verb and a non-finite. Usually it's the infinitive, but the gerund can also be used after particular modal expressions. And we also have the compound verbal aspect predicate. This predicate consists of a verb denoting the beginning, continuation or ending of an action and a non-finite, that is the infinitive or the gerund. That being said, let's look at some examples. She couldn't help laughing at his words. Couldn't help laughing at his words is a compound verbal modal predicate, as it contains a modal phrase, couldn't help, and the gerund, laughing. The dog started running after his car, or we all stopped speaking when the professor entered the room. In these sentences, we have compound verbal aspect predicates. Why? Because in the first case, the dog started running, we have the verb to start that denotes the beginning of the action plus the gerund. And in the second one, we all stopped speaking. We have the verb to stop that denotes the end of the action. So these compound predicates are compound verbal aspect predicates. The gerund can also function as an object. It can be used as both a direct and a prepositional object. Cats can stand washing. Eric likes mowing the lawn. I hate being late. In these sentences, gerunds are used as direct objects. Jessica didn't succeed in fencing. Travis got a fine for speeding. In these sentences, 
the gerund functions as a prepositional object because we can see prepositions in front of it in and for right apart from that the gerund can function as a complex object what is a complex object that's an object that consists of many components would you mind my opening the window i don't really like your talking to me like that she couldn't imagine they're not being present at the ceremony these are our complex objects with the gerund in them we can put the question what to each of them would you mind what my opening the window i don't really like what you're talking to me like that she couldn't imagine what she couldn't imagine they're not being present at the ceremony also the gerund is used as an attribute in this rule the gerund is always preceded by a preposition and i would like to draw your attention to this role of the gerund because here both the role or the function in a sentence and the form of the gerund in participle one coincide the difference is that the gerund has a preposition in front of it while participle one does not she has a gift of seeing people's true nature we heard the sound of meowing near our door there is still a chance of catching the last train to rome he has this strange habit of rolling his eyes that scares me the thought of her getting married again upset him the hypsometer is a device for measuring atmospheric pressure he seemed to show no signs of irritation at being disturbed why do we say that the gerund here is an attribute well because it characterizes the noun or the noun phrase that precedes it she has a gift of seeing people's true nature what kind of gift does she have we heard the sound of meowing near our door what sound did we hear there is still a chance of catching the last train to rome what kind of chance do we still have and so on and so forth now the gerund can be used as different adverbal modifiers in particular an adverbal modifier of time of matter of attendant circumstances of cause of condition of purpose and of concession in this role too the gerund is always preceded by a preposition the most common adverbs that the gerund can function as are those of time manner and attendant circumstances let's see you can make a fire by rubbing two sticks against each other what do we see here we see that the gerund here functions as an adverbal modifier of manner in which manner can you make a fire they plan to spend a couple of days in prague before going back to england here it is an adverbal modifier of time before going back to england yeah when lemon juice is great for cleaning your bathroom here it is an adverbal modifier of purpose lemon juice is great for doing what for what purpose the government is afraid to tax fuel for fear of not being re-elected here the gerund is in the role of the adverbial modifier of cause and the last one in spite of being tired he helped the kids with their school project now let's see when we use the gerund and when other non-finite forms of the verb in particular the infinitive and participle one must be used in addition to that Let's discuss what differentiates the gerund from participle one and from verbal nouns, which, as I have already mentioned, also have the suffix ing. And let us start with the difference between the gerund and the infinitive. The gerund often competes with the infinitive because it may be used after the same verbs as the infinitive. That's why there is a lot of confusion among English learners whether they should use the gerund or the infinitive in this or that situation. Let's try to make things clear. Only the gerund is used with the following verbs and verbal phrases. To avoid, to deny, to enjoy, to excuse, to fancy, to finish, to forgive, to mind, to postpone, cannot help, and to feel like. Of course, these are not all the verbs that the gerund is used after. Let's proceed to leave off, to succeed in, to look forward to, to rely on, 
to be aware of, to be proud of, to be surprised at, to put off, to give up, to go on, to burst out. What characterizes the second list of verbs? Well, they all use prepositions. They are either phrasal verbs or prepositional verbs. The infinitive typically is not used after prepositions. This is where the gerund is used. And that's why in majority of cases with the phrasal verbs, you will have the gerund, not the infinitive. Let's now look at some examples with these verbs after which we can only use the gerund. Please excuse my not being present at the ceremony. She denied having fed the dog with that fish. He always avoided being asked about his sister. I don't mind your going out with my cousin. Jane doesn't feel like leaving yet. It looks like raining again. Many postpone going to the doctor because they cannot afford the fee. Alex never forgave his wife's lying to him. Instead of the gerund, a subordinate clause can be used, but not the infinitive. Please excuse my not being present at the ceremony can be paraphrased into please excuse me that I wasn't present at the ceremony. She denied having fed the dog with that fish. She denied that she had fed the dog with that fish and so on and so forth. I want to draw your attention to the modal phrase cannot help. Look at this sentence. My God, I cannot help listening to the song. That means that the song is so catchy that I cannot stop listening to it. I listen to it again and again. But we have a different expression in the language and that's cannot help but. And this expression is followed by the infinitive. Let's see. I can't help but listen to the song. The infinitive is used here and the infinitive is bare. Let's take a look at a different example. I cannot help getting emotional listening to this song. What do we have here? We have the gerund cannot help doing something and participle one listening to this song. That is when I am listening to the song. Participle one here functions as an adverbal modifier of time. The structures cannot help but do something and cannot help doing something are synonymous, so they have similar meaning. Now, after some verbs, both the gerund and the infinitive can be used. These verbs are to be afraid, to begin, to start, to stop, to continue, to seize, to like, to dislike, to prefer, to fear, to hate, to intend, to recollect, to remember, to forget, to try, can or cannot afford. There may or may not be a difference in meaning. For example, there is no difference in meaning with the verbs to begin, to start and to continue. Let's see. It started to rain. It started raining. The sentences express the same thing. I am continued to eat as if nothing was going on. And I am continued eating as if nothing was going on. The sentences are equal. The ideas that they express are similar. With some verbs, the infinitive is mostly used with reference to a special occasion, while the gerund is used in general statements. Let's see. Michael was never afraid of voicing his opinion. Michael was silent during the class because he was afraid to make a mistake. In the first case, we speak about the general situation. And in the second case, Michael was afraid to do something in a particular situation. I don't like to interrupt him. What he's saying is very important. And I don't like interrupting people, it's rude. The second example here speaks about the general situation. I don't like it in general. I don't like to interrupt him. The first example speaks about a particular situation in which I don't want to do that. I want to interrupt him in a particular situation. Let's look at this sentence. I don't like getting bills, but when I do get them, I like to pay them a sap. I don't like paying bills in general, but on those particular occasions when I do get them, I like to pay them as soon as possible. The situation is different with some other verbs, though. Let's compare. He stopped watching television 
and he stopped to tie his shoelaces. In the first sentence, the gerund is used. He stopped what? The sentence means that he quitted watching television. He watches TV no more. In the second case, the infinitive is used and the question we can put to the sentence is with what purpose did he stop? He stopped in order to do what? He stopped in order to tie his shoelaces. The sentence means that he made a pause. He stopped walking for a little while in order to tie his shoelaces. So, as you see, these two sentences are completely different. They express completely different ideas. Let's take a look at two more examples. She stopped drinking coffee. She stopped what? She quitted what, right? And he stopped to buy an espresso. Why did he stop? With what purpose did he stop? He stopped in order to buy an espresso. Let's take a look at several more cases when the verb that precedes our non-finite is the same, but the meaning will change depending on whether it is the gerund or the infinitive. There will be a separate video on this channel dedicated to the differences between these verbs. In today's lesson, I just want to illustrate some cases which present a particular difficulty for English learners. Uh, we are running low of water. Please don't forget to order water delivery. And this delivery is a pleasant surprise. I completely forgot ordering it. The finite verb in both of these sentences is the same, though in the first one we use the infinitive, whereas in the second we use the gerund. The first sentence speaks about the future, things that are yet to come that we need to remember to do in the future. The second sentence speaks about a memory. I forgot that I had ordered that something. I don't have a memory of ordering it. Though I was in a hurry, I remembered to water the cacti. I remember speaking to Jane yesterday morning. Again, the finite verb is the same, but the non-finites are different. I remembered to water the cacti means I didn't forget to water them. This is what I did. And in this sentence, I remember speaking to Jane yesterday. We are again speaking about a memory. I remember what? That I spoke to her yesterday. I'm sleepy all the time. Try going to bed before 10 p.m. I tried to fix the tap myself, but nothing came out of it. To try doing something means to experiment with something just in case it works. And try to do something implies an effort. When you try to do something, like in this case, when you try to fix the tap, you put an effort in doing it. And usually the result of the action we are talking about is negative, like I tried to do this or that, but it didn't work. What would be the difference between the gerund and participle 1, then? The forms of these two verbals are the same. We add the suffix ing to the stem of the verb, but their functions are different. The gerund is a verbal that is used as a noun. Consequently, in a sentence, the gerund performs all the functions that a noun can perform. I can't stand there yelling at each other. Jane apologized for her son's behavior. Learning languages may be fun. He doesn't like talking to strangers. Her hobby is dancing. So we see that the gerund in all of the sentences performs the same functions as nouns do. In the first and in the second sentences, the gerund is used as an object. I can stand what, or Jane apologized for what, in the third sentence, it's the subject of the sentence. He doesn't like talking. Again, it's an object. He doesn't like what. In the last sentence, her hobby is dancing. The gerund is a part of a compound nominal predicate here. Now, participle 1 acts like an adjective. Consequently, in a sentence, it functions as an attribute or as an adverbial modifier. Everyone was staring at the yelling man. Hearing his steps, she ran to the door. 
you'll say, wait a minute, but the gerund can also be used as an attribute and as an adverbal modifier. Yes, it can. For instance, like in our example, we heard the sound of meowing near our door. But the gerund in the function of an attribute as well as in the function of an adverbal modifier is always preceded by a preposition, while participle 1 is not. For example, when it's an attribute, it's typically preceded by of, like in this example with meowing. We heard the sound of meowing near our door. What kind of sound, right? Of meowing. When it's an adverbial modifier, it can be preceded by several different prepositions. Like in these examples, lemon juice is great for cleaning your bathroom in spite of being tired, he agreed to help us, and in this one, after hearing the news, they changed their plans for the weekend. Now let me paraphrase the last example using participle 1. I will drop the preposition and we'll have here in the news they changed their plans for the weekend. Now the sentence contains participle 1 and not the gerund. So once again, here in his steps, she ran to the door. Doing what? Here in his steps, participle 1. But after hearing the news, they changed their plans for the weekend. After what? After hearing. The gerund is used. Now, what is the difference then between the gerund and the verbal noun? First of all, what is a verbal noun? It's a noun created from a verb. Let's look at these examples. He enjoyed her singing very much. Her beautiful singing won his heart. In the first case, we are dealing with the gerund. He enjoyed her singing very much. In the second case, singing is a verbal noun. Her beautiful singing won his heart. Let's take a look at a couple of different examples. The stealing of classified information is a crime. I know Jane isn't capable of stealing anything. Now, in the first case, stealing is a verbal noun, whereas in the second case, it's a gerund. Let's see what characteristics can help us differentiate one from the other. As we know, the gerund has both verbal and nominal nature. Verbal nouns have only nominal character, as they are nouns. Gerunds are not used with articles. For instance, she was never fond of cooking. Verbal nouns do use articles like normal nouns, like any noun. She helped her mother with the cooking. Gerunds have no plural forms. He couldn't help doing it again and again. Verbal nouns, of course, do have plural forms, like many other nouns. They close their eyes on his wrongdoings. The gerund of transitive verbs may take a direct object. I gave up reading that boring book. I gave up reading what? Verbal nouns can only take a prepositional object with the preposition of. The reading of the first chapter was finished. And gerunds may be modified by an adverb, like he warned her against driving fast, while verbal nouns may be modified by an adjective. He warned her against fast driving because verbs are modified by adverbs and nouns are modified by adjectives. So this is basically it. This is how we differentiate between gerunds and verbal nouns. That's all for today. If you feel that my lessons help you and you want to support me, you can do it here or following the link in the description to this video. I will appreciate that very much. Also, I appreciate your comments and likes. They help my videos to be seen by more people around the world so that more people who learn English by themselves can find the answers to the questions they have. In my next lesson, we'll be speaking about the participle. So if it's something that you're interested in, please stay tuned, subscribe to this channel and see you in the next video.